Good afternoon. Welcome to Preservation Connecticut Spring 2022 series talking about preservation. Our noontime chats about everything preservation. I'm Jane Montanaro, Executive Director of Preservation Connecticut, and I'm delighted to be your host. Today we are chatting with Ken Staffy, the researcher and author behind the popular house stories on Facebook and Instagram. Mr. Staffy will talk about his adventures and research and share some of his most interesting experiences as he investigates the people and stories behind the old houses of the region. But before I hand the controls over to Ken, let me give you a brief intro into Preservation Connecticut. Preservation Connecticut is the statewide private nonprofit historic preservation organization founded in 1975 by a special act of the Connecticut General Assembly as the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation to preserve, protect, and promote the building sites and landscapes that contribute to the heritage and vitality of Connecticut's communities. We are statutory partners with the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office. And I'm proud to say that for over four decades, we have successfully championed the protection of remarkable community assets all over the state by leveraging funding, advocating, forming partnerships, and promoting stewardship. Our office is on Whitney Avenue in Hamden, Connecticut. It's listed on the National Register of Histor Historic Places, shown here. It's the Eli Whitney Boarding House, built in 1827 to house workers for Eli Whitney's factory, and it has served as Preservation Connecticut's headquarters since 1989. We have a staff of nine preservation professionals and a board of 21 preservationists from around the state. Staff, listed here, are always available to assist with inquiries, Christopher Wiegren is our deputy director. Contact Chris for information on historic preservation easements, our bi-monthly magazine, Connecticut Preservation News, our Olmstead in Connecticut statewide landscape survey project, or to arrange a book talk for his book, Connecticut Architecture, Stories of 100 Places. Renee, Tr Renee Trubert, Making Places and Preservation Services Manager, Please contact Renee for information on redevelopment of historic industrial sites and tax credit applications. Jordan Sorensen is our development and special projects manager. Jordan manages our communications and outreach to members through social media and email, receives and monitors demolition notices from municipalities, and pre prepares historic tax credit applications and nominations to the state and National Register of Historic Places. Kristen Hopewood, Development Assistant, manages all of the inquiries that come through our website, provides member services, arranges special events, and is the editor of our Historic Properties Exchange, a free listing of threatened historic properties. And finally, our team of circuit riders, Brad Scheid, Mike Farino, Stacey Varro, and Stefan Danchuk, provide immediate boots on the ground service to homeowners, developers, municipal leaders, nonprofit organizations and museums, historic dis district commissions, and more, with an array of preservation technical assistance, including community organizing, prioritizing maintenance and repairs, historic designations, funding, and archeology. span These chats have served as a meaningful way for us to continue our mission during the pandemic. We've been able to connect with the public and hear what's on your mind. Please feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions, ask questions directly at the end of the presentation or contact us afterwards for a site visit or a call. And many thanks to our sponsor, Paul B. Bailey Architect for generously underwriting our 2022 Connecticut Preservation Awards Ceremony and for supporting Talking About Preservation Programming. Next week, join us. Next week, join us. Um, Wednesday, June 15th, for undertaking a passive house retrofit with Karen Patriquin, Patriquin, <laughs> Patriquin Architects. So with that, it's time for me to hand it over to <laughs> Ken. So Ken, I will stop sharing and you can pull up your slides. Okay, thank you, Jane. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, Perfect. Great. Let's see if we can do this flawlessly. Okay. And you can see my slides. Not yet. Okay, sorry, one second. Let's see, apologies. That's okay. Ah, uh, here we go, share screen.
And now you can. Now we can, yes. Okay, let me just get it in the mode that we're sharing, slideshow. Almost, okay. Well, thank you, Jane, and thank you, Stacy, for inviting me, and thank you for everyone at Preservation Connecticut um, for all you do. Actually, in, during when I was pre uh, preparing this presentation, I realized that I had used your resources a lot more than I had known. So I appreciate that, and we'll, we'll kind of touch on some of those. Just to give you a little bit of background, House Stories is the um, my Instagram page. It's also on Facebook, but you can find it online. You can just put in House Stories underscore, and you'll find now there's 2,300 stories, most of them from Connecticut, and I'm happy to say that the most popular posts consistently are the ones from Connecticut. I live in Connecticut. I'm currently in Westbrook at the Bushnell House, a circa 19, 18, excuse me, 1840 bed and breakfast that I'm returning to to do this presentation, but I live in Bridgeport in a 1928 house, so not as old, but uh, and, and not as historic. But what do we do? We explore the history, um, finding historic homes, historic figures, but also older homes and everyday figures. You'll see that some of the best stories we have are people that either they're lost to history or they never really were known by a lot of people, but some great stories. Um, I'm not a professional historian, as I told Jane and Stacy when we first got on. I, my degrees are in healthcare. I've worked in healthcare since I started at Bridgeport Hospital as a teenager and uh, worked at different companies. So I think the message for everyone here is, as long as you love history, you can find something that you, that you enjoy. You can do this too. You can find out about things that you are interested in and become your own amateur historian. And what do we do? We, in telling the story behind the homes, we're telling our history. And even though things are a lot different than they were in 1840, 1672, there's a lot of things that are the same, as you'll see in some of these stories. And the best thing about it, history is accessible more than ever, thanks to places like Preservation Connecticut, Google Books, and other resources that we'll share. I never go, people say, do you go to historical societies? And I love them and God bless them, but I never go to historical societies. I never go to vaults and, and libraries and stuff. Everything is online. Um, and, and probably again, more so than ever, that you'd be blown away by what you can find online. And the good thing is history is all around us. Um, sometimes I'll, basically most of these stories are just things that I saw a picture past a house and said, that looks really interesting. Let's find out the history. And here we are. So um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And what I would say is, what people mostly ask me, and I, I was surprised because I have a friend who has a master's in history, and she said, and she teaches history, she said, how do you find all this history? And I said, okay, well, this is a good place to start. A few weeks ago, I drove up to Wallingford, and actually, I'd never been through a lot of Wallingford and, and didn't realize all the wonderful old houses there. Some of you may recognize the ne Nehemiah Royce house, in Wallingford, which is now part of their preservation, historic preservation trust in Wallingford. Um, but if I wanna find out what is the history behind Nehemiah, Nehemiah Royce house or the Bushnell house right here, what do I do? I use Google, I use Google Books. Google Books is extraordinary. We, we may not be the biggest fans of everything that big tech does, but the fact that there are books from 1850 that are scanned in, is remarkable. And there's a lot of things that we don't have now. Um, there'll be a history about, let's say, Nehemiah Royce's grandson, and it will be in a book like a Connecticut Quarterly. And that was kind of like, they maybe they had obituaries, but then they also memorialized them and they would put a history of that person in those books, which are thankfully scanned in. A lot of the historical societies have sites that we can use. Some towns have everything online. Some towns, not as much, but I did see that there's some more grants to get more things online. So that's exciting, right, Jane? <laughs> um, again, as I said, Connecticut Preserva Preservation Connecticut. Um, what's really great, you'll see a lot of the links to historic district filings. And one thing that I realized that I didn't even know was a resource from Preservation Connecticut is the barn, the historic barns. Now there's a lot of things and, and we'll go over them in a bit, but barns are a great way that they've, there's a barn tour, there's a resource collecting all these barns. 
that's the way that I found out a lot of histories. You'll find out maybe who the owner is, the architectural style, and on and on. Also, um, census information is great. Um, Deb Cohen from Front Door Project, great person, friend of mine, she pointed out when we did one of these last time that we might not have free access to some of these things, but libraries do. So that's a good thing to know. When I hit a roadblock and can't find anything about a house, particularly a house, I don't really touch anything that's less than 100 years old. I don't want to put anybody's personal information who may be alive or their children may be alive. But if you come up against a roadblock, newspaper.com and a couple others are great because you can read the newspapers from 1870, 1920, 1930. And the great thing is those newspapers are totally different than they are today. Um, newspapers in like 1950 were like the Facebook of today. Jane is going to Rochester to visit with her aunt and she's going to have tea and she's going to visit her friends. And that will be in the society page or the, the basically the Facebook page of the newspaper back then. So that's a great resource that probably some people don't realize. Some of them you do have to subscribe, but I found when I'm up against, I can't find anything that they're, they're kind of a good way to find some um, hints. Okay, so that's how we start. So we go back, let's go to back to the Nehemiah Royce house. I just plug that in, plug that into Google. What do I find? I find a Wikipedia listing. Historic Buildings of Connecticut is another great site. Um, you might find Find a Grave. Find a Grave is great because a lot of people will do their genealogy and then link back to the grave site and kind of put their family trees on there so it's not behind a paywall. So that's one way you can start it there. There's some places to start. And then if I keep looking, um, one of these I think is from the, the Preservation Connecticut. Um, there's old pictures of the house. You see that the Nehemiah Royce house was red. And I saw there was some people commenting, why is it white? And, and a lot of houses during that time were not white, but I did read that in the preservation and the restoration, they actually did some paint analysis and they said it was most likely white. So there it is. There's the Wikipedia page. Wikipedia is a surprisingly good resource. And I didn't, you'll see an older picture here, but there's also sometimes, um, you know, when they had the work project administration around then in the depression, one of the things they did to employ, they employed artists and musicians in other ways, but they employed, employed photographers to go do an inventory of these old homes. So sometimes you'll stumble upon those and they're like 1938, 1940s pictures of these homes that are great. Um, and some of them, unfortunately, are no longer with us. So those are some resources. Uh, and you know, here's one, um, and I'll, we'll get into it in a second, but the, this is actually a resource from the 1800s. And by the way, if there's any questions, let me know, Jane, because I can't see them readily. Feel free to jump in. Um, that's a resource much, much closer to that time. You know, this person's reporting on what his mother and grandmother said, and they were much closer to the early days of Wallingford. I'll, I'll get into the story, but one thing that's kind of interesting is Wallingford. We think, okay, that's a nice little town. But back then, this person says it was teeming with wildlife, thousands of wolves and turkeys and, and uh, all these things. And these people, New Haven was almost a day away, uh, hours and hours away, which is only 14 miles. And Hartford was more than a day away for, for them. So these people really moved to the wilderness. Um, you see on here, there's some family tree information from the different sites I mentioned. Here's another one. Um, so those are things that I could use to put the um, resources. There's a lot of books about, you know, weddings. Maybe a church that in, in Wallingford recorded all their weddings and that's scanned online through those Google books that I mentioned. But one thing you have to be afraid of, um, I called them earlier false friends, like we say in, in language, that there's things that can lead you down the wrong path. And a lot of people um, with good intentions will probably, they'll kind of put some mistaken uh, family trees up there. If you've done some of your own research, you may have come up against this. A lot of times this is because people have the same names or similar names. Um, even I saw this with Nehemiah. Nehemiah was born in 1630. This house was built in 1672 or 1670 in Wallingford. But there's another, there's a son, Nehemiah. There's a grandson, Nehemiah. And, and so that could get confusing. 
also something that we don't do now is the family, if they had, let's say, Nehemiah and Hannah, Hannah Morgan Brace, if they had a child and the child passed away, let's say they had a child, Anna, the child passed away, they would name their next daughter, Anna. Um, it's a nice trip at, uh, tribute. Right now, we might think that's a bit morbid, but it also can get you down the wrong path when you're looking at histories of family trees. Also, cross family trees, like I said, wrong generations, or, or just lots of people in the same town with the same name. So we look at Mindwell Royce. That's a third generation Royce from ones we're talking about. Her father is Benjamin Royce. And guess what her husband's name was? Benjamin Royce. And I went backwards through those family trees and they're not, it's not like she married her first cousin or anything, but that can get confusing, right? So those are things to watch out for. The good thing is at this point, 2022, a lot of people have already done their research. With the Royces, there's people who went back to England and looked through the records and they said, okay, because the Robert and um, Mary, Mary Sims Royce, they went back and they said, there's, okay, there's too many people conflicting. They said, okay, this has to be this one. Robert Royce and Mary Sims from Somerset or thereabouts. And this is the family. Um, okay, so what does this let us come up with? Uh, what do we find out that goes with the story behind the house? The Royce family came to America aboard the, the ship, the Francis, in 1630 as part of the Great Puritan Migration. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. The, the started with the Mayflower and the other ships, um, but they came across on the Francis. They eventually settled in Stratford and then New London. So some of our earliest towns. Um, David, the father, he bought lots in Wallingford for um, his sons, Samuel, Nehemiah, Isaac, and Nathaniel. And as I said, Wallingford was very isolated at the time. I and mean, think about these people who giving birth with no doctor around and, and, and so on. Obviously no hospitals or anything like that. And what else do we find? 38 proprietors settled the town. That means that 38 men, unfortunately that was the, the custom of the day. 38 men were the people who signed. They purchased land from um, variously attributed, most likely to the Quinnipiac. Um, they purchased the land, 136 residents, 36 men, 34 women, 56 children. And those people included the oldest person to settle Wallingford was Catherine Miles. She was 85, but I guess life in Wallingford wasn't so bad because she lived to 96. They built that big white house that we talked about and they had nine children. And fortunately it looks like most of their children lived. I mean, it's sad because we'll hear later on that there's examples where people lost a lot of their children. And sometimes in, in, in uh, smallpox, they lose half their family. Um, Nathaniel, Royce, his brother, he married four times because he left, lost his wife. A lot of these women were lost in childhood. Um, the house was called the, the, the Washington Elm House because George Washington visited twice, one on his way to Boston to take over the Continental Army, and another way, another time he spoke in front of the house. The house has been moved a little bit, but um, Thankfully, the family owned it for over 200 years. It was restored by people who really appreciated its history. And Choate Rosemary Hall used it as a residence. And in 1999, they gave the house to the Wallingford Historic Preservation Trust. So here's a fun one. There's thousands of descendants of, of um, Nehemiah and Hannah, including Millard Fillmore, our 13th president, Frederick Law Olmsted, who was from Hartford, or perhaps West Hartford, but he, he designed the parks everywhere, Central Park, Beersley Park and Bridgeport, parks I'm sure in Hartford and, and beyond. And his eighth great-great-grandson, Clint Eastwood, can trace right back to Nehemiah and Hannah. But not Kevin Bacon, that's one of our false friends there. There's one thing that says Kevin Bacon, eight degrees of Kevin Bacon, uh, when you look back, it's, it's not true. Somebody was, was tripped up or having a little fun with our history there. So that's the Royce House, kind of gives you a little how the sausage is made with the historic house stories. Um, let's go into some other stories. I thought that that would kind of give you an idea of how this works. And I can tell you, yes, you do go down rabbit holes, but it can be fun. And sometimes you say, okay, that's too good to be true. That doesn't work out. And I've had people who, who have historic houses and they say, yes, yes, Jane lived here in 1840 and she gave it to her son. And you go back in and said, can't happen. 
Jane's way too young to live here in 1840. She did not own this house. And so, you know, that, that all good intentions, but sometimes if it doesn't seem right, double check it. The good thing is enough people are out there doing family trees, especially with thousands of race descendants. There's enough family trees out there that you can usually double check it. If it doesn't, if I can't double check it, I usually leave it out, skip it over. Because there was another family tree for Nehemiah and Hannah that was totally off base. Mercies and Marcy's and stuff, and they're not their children. Okay, so just to give you an idea, I'm here at the Bushnell house. I think you can see the mantle beside me, but it's a house that was built in 1840. Um, the Bushnells had settled Saybrook um, after Francis had sailed on the St. John with his daughter, Sarah and Rebecca. And on board, what's different about that is they, they signed the Guilford Covenant on board the St. Francis, St. John, excuse me. And that was basically that we're going to take care of each other. Um, that was kind of a nice and different piece of history. So that's the Guilford Covenant. The fun thing is this house is, um, you know, we can all appreciate houses as we go by. We can go to house museums and we should. And we, and we definitely should appreciate all the work that goes into it. But this is one where we can actually stay. I stayed at the suite upstairs. Um, you can see in the, the two pictures of the suite. That's the picture from the hat front. And there's a little story from the New York Times. There were um, a bunch of um, people who worked together in New York City when the city closed down the, during the pandemic. They rented the whole house and they had the house. They worked here and they had fun because they, you know, they couldn't go and uh, do what they normally did. So here they were in enjoying this historic home. When I was here, look across the street outside my window, I looked at the house that's named in honor of David Bushnell. So David Bushnell didn't live there. It's the Bushnell Museum of Early Engineering. Jane and your folks may be familiar with this museum, a gentleman who keeps it. There's a lot of early implements of engineering, but I think the story of David Bushnell is fascinating and probably mostly because a lot of us don't even know about David Bush now. Um, I did do a story earlier on, but he, when his, after his father died, he finally got his inheritance at 31. He sold his part of the farm um, here. It was in, uh, yeah, Westbrook. He sold it to his brother and enrolled at Yale at 31. That was a time when people went off to Yale at 16 uh, or maybe 17. And while he was there, I think he was quite the character because he was kind of obsessed with proving that gunpowder could ignite underwater. Um, <laughs> that came in handy just a couple years later because the uh, Revolutionary War broke out and he built a one-man vessel, and I'll show you a picture in a second, that would be able to go underwater, attach explosives to the enemy ship, and quickly back up and then explode. Um, he trained his brother to do this, his brother Ezra, Ezra Bushnell, because David was, he was kind of a nervous wreck and he wasn't in the best shape. So he trained his brother, Ezra Bushnell. Ezra Bushnell got sick with typhoid. And so Ezra Lee stood in and we'll show you how complicated this was. It attempted to um, sink the British ship, the Eagle. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and that, attempt failed, but God bless Ezra Lee. If you look at this thing, there's only 30 minutes of air in this, this capsule that they called the turtle because it kind of looked like two turtle shells put together. Uh, pretty amazing that it was watertight, but he'd have to ballast, let some water in and out to go up and down. He'd turn the rudder to move um, backwards and forwards in the water and then turn another uh, device to go up and down. Can you imagine doing all these things, 30 minutes of water, getting up to a ship, turning a screw to attach a bomb? So he gets up to the, the eagle, goes to attach the bomb. He comes up against the metal plate and can't get it in. And a second attempt failed as well. Uh, later, engineering folks looked at everything and they said, you know what? If this it, he had come up against wood, this should have worked. The, he did have a timing device. Um, so Bushnell not only is basically this is the first um, military submarine that was ever used. There wasn't another submarine in place until the Civil War. And um, so, so it should have worked. So Bushnell is credited with create, uh, building this first military submarine. 
building a certain type of propeller. I think it's called a screw propeller. And also um, this detonating device. It had a timing mechanism because they had to time it and then turn all these things and get out of the way before the thing blew up. Um, Washington, even though it didn't work, Washington called this an effort of genius and he appointed Bushnell to the Corps of Miners and Sappers, which we now know as the Army Corps of, Semin Army Corps of Engineers. Um, Bushnell kind of didn't give up. He went to Europe. There's some discussion of what he did there, but thought that he continued his experiments there. At some point, he moved back to Connecticut and then he moved to Georgia. That was one on this story I was tripped up. Why did he move to Georgia? And we'll find out what he did while he was there. But, and the only little clue that I could find is that he had a, a bill collector. You know, he wasn't so successful with this turtle, probably didn't have a lot of money. He already gave up his inheritance. So the one story was that he, he escaped a ruthless bill collector. Why did he escape or what did he do? He actually changed his name. He became a teacher. He helped start and teach at three different schools. And then he became a physician. And when he died, people in Warrington, Georgia said, wait, Dr. Bush, Dr. David Bush is really David Bush now. They found pieces that he continued working in his home on basically try, probably trying to improve his submarine. So it's a story that probably most people in Connecticut, we don't know, but there's kind of fun things. And that's what's kind of fun is Instagram, Facebook, and other things are pretty accessible or even things like this where we can learn about things like the turtle if we, if we didn't already know about them. Okay, moving on. So this is a house in Stratford that some people got in touch with me and said, hey, can we save this house? And I looked at the house and said, geez, I don't know, it's not such a beautiful house, but uh, the developer wanted to put up a huge apartment block in a place of this house. I said, yeah, yeah, but there's, there's a history here. So Lily De Devereaux Blake, who's Lily De Devereaux Blake? Well, we know Elizabeth Cady Stanton, we know Susan B. Anthony, but we don't know Lily Devereaux Blake, but we should. Um, she lived for a time in this house in Stratford. She went, well, she tried to go to Yale. Eventually she had some people teaching her the course at Yale because they wouldn't let her in back in 1800. She was born in 1830. But we can thank Lily Devereaux Blake, um, way before women had the right to vote, for getting them the right to vote in school elections, to work as census takers, to have women physicians in mental institutions when women were admitted. Before that, they were subject to male doctors and also matrons for prisoners. Um, she wanted to take over for Susan B. Anthony when Susan B. Anthony was retiring from the movement suffragist movement, but Susan B. Anthony, according to some doc, uh, recorded history, she didn't like Blake's ambitious. She was a little too much for Susan B. Anthony. And she also didn't like that Susan B., uh, Lily was focused on not just women's votes, but women's complete rights. So Lily Devereaux Blake has kind of lost her history. Um, but in the end, because of this history, this house did get saved. The developer did agree to incorporate it into a smaller development to, to preserve the structure. And I really love her. Um, I'm somebody who grew up in Stratford and I loved her. Um, she wrote a book called Southhold and she characterized um, Stratford as if some enchantress had waved her fairy wand over the lovely village and held it in a sweet spell of perpetual tranquility. Um, all the history of Stratford talks about Stratford in the 1800s, probably not a lot was happening that changed from even the late 1600s or 1700s. So a fun little story, a, a character. There's more online about um, Lily that makes her even seem like quite the character for 1800 New England. Um, so that's one story. And Jane, feel free to jump in if you have any comments or questions. Now the Mitchell house, again, somebody I never heard of, Simeon Mitchell, Anna Mitchell, didn't know, just drove by this house. It's in South Britain, Connecticut. That's kind of like a, I don't even know if it's a borough, but one of these historic areas, historic just district. It was built for Simeon and Anna Mitchell and their son, Mitchell Mitchell, or Mitchell, Simeon Mitchell. He lived here. Um, and I guess what makes it most interesting is he often hosts this preacher, Lorenzo Dow. And, we didn't know Lorenzo Dow, but he sounds like he was quite the character as he drove crowds of 10,000 people um, with his kind of crazy appearance as a preacher with unkempt hair, his beard, his thread threadbare clothes. He 
He's shouting, he begged, he joked. He's quite the performer. Can you imagine 10,000 people going to see somebody without microphones and jumbotrons and everything? But that was entertainment for the day. He was so popular that a lot of people named their son Lorenzo back in the 1800s. Um, and so he preached at Simon's funeral. He, he wittily recalled his friend. He made jokes about his faults and so on. Simeon was there in his coffin wrapped in a shroud um, with co copper coins in his eyes. And as he wrapped up, Simeon sat up from his, in his coffin, took off the shroud and said, that was great. Um, really happy with how this went. Let's go back to the house and have a party. So obviously Lorenzo wasn't the only joker there. Um, another fun story from history with Simeon, Simeon Mitchell and Lorenzo Dow. And that's in Southbury. Again, go by the house, looks like an interesting house. Wouldn't know that there's all this history there. All of this, again, found online. Going back to Stratford with the Tomlin. I, 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 this one, when Stacy asked me to present, this one stuck out at me, mostly because um, the last bullet, there's a gravestone for their daughter, Mary Alice. And there's four little, there's a little angel face and four little tiny angel face for their four unnamed infants. And you can see this not too far from their house. Their house was moved from Main Street, but um, this is now on um, Elm Street in Stratford. But let's look a little bit at their history. Agar and Mary Tomlinson, they built this house in 770, 1772. So about the same time that Simeon uh, was building his house, Simeon and Anne, I believe, uh, they built this house. But by then they already buried five of their children, five of 10 children. So Agar was a music, physician, excuse me. He studied at Yale. He died at 53. And then 10 months later, his daughter Katie died. Um, and then in reality of the time, sadly, his will included his property and two enslaved women. Excuse me, excuse that misspelling. It's two enslaved women. By the time Mary died at seven, at 78, she had buried nine of her 10 children. I mean, unimaginable, and her husband. Um, and as I mentioned, that gravestone, which is still there in Stratford. But their house still looks great, right? From 1772. Okay. So, you know, one of the things is that history is all around us, particularly in Connecticut, we have treasures. Um, and I would say also that, you know, I think that in Connecticut, we, we may not know this, we may not appreciate it, probably Jane and her folks do because of all the work they do. I think we do a better job of preserving that history, not necessarily, not only the structures, but the history behind the structures. Like I said, you can go on a barn tour and all the other resources that there are there, the town green tour, the historic districts, the mills, creative places, all with cre um, Preservation Connecticut. I go to Boston, Massachusetts, you know, the cradle of liberty, supposedly, or whatever, tea party and so on. It's really hard to find resources. Maybe they're kind of so, they have so much of it that they don't preserve it. But we here we do, we're lucky, um, and, and, and not in other parts of the country. Um, if you want to visit, you know, I urge people to to get in in the middle of history. There's historic homes um, in all corners of the state. We have a small state, but there's history everywhere. Um, I looked up last night as I was wrapping this up on CT Visit. That's basically the Connecticut tourism site. There's so many historic attractions, um, not only house museums, but different um, uh, things. Uh, there's, you know, um, Mystic Seaport, which is a living museum, much like Sturbridge over the border in Massachusetts. And those are great because they have got folks who are in character. But I mean, there's, I went on, I was shocked at all the things that I had never even been to or even heard of. Um, like I said, all the stuff that Preservation Connecticut does, online resources, local historical societies, and all the good work that they do. And not only do they do, and Preservation CT does this too, is they save some of our history. They save a lot of our history. You know, there was a time, you know, I, I live in Bridgeport. There's a lot of treasures that were lost, the Wheeler Mansion and all the great buildings downtown that were that were um, knocked down. But, you know, the good thing is a lot of times now we will give pause, like Lily Blake's house. We'll try to save it, try to save that history, even if it's in some way, rather than knocking it down. So I, I wanted to say thank you for everybody who does work to 
save our treasures and our history and those people who are part of it. And we can do that anyway. We can, we can pay tribute to those people like doing anything, staying in a historic inn or visiting one of our museums. And um, by the way, Mark Twain House is a great museum. I, I just think of, there's a plant in their solarium that was there when Mark Twain was there. How cool is that? Right down the street, Harriet Beecher Stowe's house. Um, so I say support historic attractions and offerings. And the good news is on Saturday, according to CT visits, on Sunday, no wait, Sunday? Uh, June 12th, I guess it's Saturday, um, is the day that we can, there's open house. And um, you can visit a lot of these sites for free. Um, so I, I want to thank Preservation Connecticut to, for inviting me to present. Um, if you're interested in learning more of these stories, uh, you could spend a lot of time looking at the 2,300 histories. There are a few repeats, and some of them are worth telling. There's a few three-parters. Um, I used to kind of give like, okay, this is kind of history in, in Twitter size, and I, now I dive a lot deeper. And again, sometimes I tell it in two or three parts, but sometimes there's so much great history to share um that i'm happy to do it i'm gonna see if there's anything in chats that i should ah sorry i'm trying to see the chats thank Has you there Ken. ever been a house that i can't find the history on yeah those are the ones you don't see on uh on house <laughs> stories um there's definitely there's definitely some houses that you can't find on that's kind of like when i've gotten to the newspaper pages that's when when i kind of give up but and then I'm surprised. Like there's one house I couldn't find anything. And I found this whole crazy story um, of somebody trying to take someone's inheritance and drug them and all these things, obviously not in the 1800s, but um, Ogden House. Yes, I've, I've done the Ogden House. Um, yes, you, you'll find uh, um, history. And the Ogden House is a museum in Fairfield. Jane, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. it's a museum. And what's the great thing is a woman who was an antique dealer in New York of French provincial antiques actually wanted to have a summer house. So she bought this house that the, was falling through the, the, the floor. She saved it. She became a huge person in, in colonial American antiques and she saved the house. Uh, let's see if I'm missing anything else. Jane, I don't know. Let's see. Ah, so there's Connecticut State Library. Uh, old house research site at Connecticut State Library. That's great. So there are houses. So, and occasionally I will get messages like, hey, can you research my house? I would say that most of the stuff I do is pretty spontaneous, that I just drive by a house and look at it. Um, although, you know, I kind of run out of houses. So I kind of look online where some good districts. Um, but if, if you are interested in your house history, do start by just putting your address into Google and see what comes up. Go to the books tab and see what comes up there. I mean, if your house is a lot more recent than, than you know, the 1800s, you're going to come up with more recent, you know, uh, people, voter registration stuff and everything. But the fun stuff is really 17 and 1800s and so on. Um, and again, there's people here who probably know a lot more research than I do. Like there's the state library and stuff that someone mentioned. Yep. But there's a lot of great stuff. Ah, is there another chat? Yep. Getting lively. Oh, good. Is, Digital archives, the... photo collection. Yes. Single best source for historic photos and floor plans. Hmm. Um, you have any thoughts on that one, Jane? That might be in your turf. Um, yeah, I think like Bryna said, the Digital Archives, Connecticut Digital, Ar Dig Digital Archives is a good resource for that. Yeah. And, and, you know, I would just say that you'd be surprised at what's, what's on there, uh, what's out there. You know, there's, there's, um, you ever see those books? I just saw one at Walgreens this morning, like historic Saybrook or something. And they, they, they kind of take pictures from the historic archives and put them into books. Um, but that's a great resource. And, and sorry that I'm not as familiar with that. Yes, library. Exactly. That's the one that I was thinking about, the historic American building survey. Um, has the floor plans and great photos from like you know 1940 that you know the house no matter what they did for pres did for preservation between then and now is not going to look like it did in 1940 and that's and that's wonderful and, and some people have worked to preserve the houses um i think the one thing that's kind of 
exciting is we all know that prices have gone up and that's not good for people who are trying to buy and move to Connecticut. But I think a lot of people have taken a second look at um, historic homes um, and, and there's houses that used to sit on the market for years and they'd be in a $600,000 market in Fairfield County and they'd be on sale for 200,000, no lie. Nobody would still touch it. I mean, we all know it's not for the faint of heart and you really have to love it. But I think there's people who are willing to, to invest and um, transform a home. Can you, uh, and I, oh, sorry, you just showed uh, the Pond Weed House and we are working with the owners of that property in Darien to- Yes, is it Craig? It's Chris and Ellen Fagan. Chris and Ellen Fagan, yes, yes, yes. I have interacted with them. That's, so that's a fun story. Like. I have interacted with them and I want to do a house story on them. I did the house story and, and I did see Pond Weed on your page. Um, and, and thanks for somebody who pointed out that open house day is Saturday. So apologize for any confusion. So definitely at least find one attraction that you can go to on there. Um, but Pond Weed, um, the Weed family goes way back and that was considered like halfway point, I think between Stanford and and uh, I don't know, Norwalk or something at that point. And the house kind of nothing was touched for years. A, a gentleman who worked on the Muppets mm -hmm. were, lived there. And, you know, he kind of got older and couldn't keep up the repairs. Somebody tried to do a, kicks, a Kickstarter campaign to kind of save the house. Thankfully, the Fagans have jumped in to save that house. And it is a gorgeous house. I can't wait to see what they do with it. Fortunately, again, we have somebody who's committed to preservation, conservation, and, and saving the house, um, which is outstanding. Thank you, Stacey. Credits and grants for people who want to buy and renovate a historic house. I know that the preservation folk can speak to this, but <laughs> I can just say that I, I do hear that there's tax breaks, but I'll let Jane, Stacey, whomever speak to that much better sure. than me. Yep, the State Historic Preservation Office does have a homeowner's tax credit program. So if you have a historic house that is listed on the State Register of Historic Places, you would be eligible for some of your renovations. And that's something that you can connect with Preservation Connecticut on and we can, uh, one of our circuit riders can take a look at the property with you and let you know if it's listed, help you get it listed, help you with prioritizing the work that's needed for the property and help you um, navigate that historic tax credit program. Now, Jane, if somebody does take the take advantage of that program, do they, um, are they also limits on what they can do? Like they have to keep the house looking the same way it did? There are variables. Um, it depends on if it's listed in a local historic district, first of all and what some of those um, guidelines are. And then the work would have to be approved by the State Historic Preservation Office to meet the Secretary of the Interior Standards. So there are, there are guidelines and our circuit riders can help you navigate with those. And by the way, you mentioned the historic districts um, and I did mention it in my presentation, but um, some of those historic district filings are gold mine. Mm -hmm. They'll give you like the original owner, they'll give you the date, often the architectural style and so on. And, you know, what's great about the historic districts is we can see basically how towns and villages developed. You know, it wasn't where you had suburbs yeah. where people, you know, worked in the town and in the suburbs. These are towns of horses and wagons and stuff. So people basically lived. There was some reason why they lived there. Was there a mill there? Was there a small factory was, you know, a lot of people were farmers, most people. So it's kind of interesting. And there wasn't, you know, there wasn't rich and poor. Everybody kind of lived together, which is, um, you know, a little different. So Jane, I don't know if you, you probably see the question, how difficult is it to get a house listed? Um, it's a process that again, our circuit riders can advise on. Um, there's, you know, determining eligibility is the first step to see if it qualifies and then working through the application process. Um, but it, I would estimate if you were going through the process, it would probably take a, a year or so to get through everything. So I, I'm interested, just because I love the name Circuit Riders, could you explain <laughs> a little bit about, it sounds kind of like, sure. you know, uh, 
old time Wild West or something. What what is circuit <laughs> riders? I, you've explained some of it, but what what do they do? So our circuit riders are um, our technical assistant staff, and as the name implies, they are out in the field. They are out driving the circuit these days. So they spend all of their time uh, meeting with homeowners, meeting with um, historical societies, museums, um, talking with anyone that has um, ties or stewardship responsibilities to a historic property. And they also conduct trainings for local historic district commissions, um, can work with municipalities to, you know, prioritize or, or you know, commu do community organizing for certain uh, resources in towns and bring grant monies into the community to do vibrant communities planning and um, also meeting with everyone to talk about all of the resources that our office has and that also links to the State Historic Preservation Office with grants and, and tax credits. And, and some people have helpfully po posted links if people aren't looking at their chats to circuit riders and preservation and your website. Um, there was also a, a mention that the Stratford Lighthouse is open on Saturday along with everything else. So that's another place to visit. I have one more question, Jane. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you see the little plaque that people have with a tree on it, like preservation. Yep. And someone said, oh, well, it's historic. And then somebody else said, oh, you can just order one of those. So maybe you can set the record straight on that. Um, well, they are um, list. They are for National Register of Historic Places. And there is a method to, if it's vertical or horizontal, I believe vertical ones are listed in a district and horizontal ones are individually listed. And you can also get plaques for your state register listing. Um, there, you can go online to see if you're listed and purchase the plaques. Yes. Okay, interesting. Thank you. And then uh, John Kelly, my new Facebook friend on House Stories, he's asking, where would you find historic district filings for Wyndham, Connecticut? Um, on our website, um, historic districts, Org, or if you can go to our main website, preservationct.org, it's easier to go to the bottom of the homepage and just find all of the other websites there. And you just search on the map for Wyndham and all of the listings will come up. And what's kind of fun, Jane, is you can see a lot of these listings in their original form. Like somebody's sitting there with a typewriter typing up these, these listings, <laughs> um, God bless them. Um, and some, you know, some are very straightforward and some people put a lot of work into these historic district listings. God bless them too. Um, so thank, and thank you, Jane and your team for keeping all these resources available. Well, thank you for exploring them all and sharing with everyone how much you use them. I know we keep track of the data analytics of how much the websites are getting used and we see that they're being used, but to have someone talk about how they really do go in there and, and use them is really satisfying. <laughs> yeah, I think what's great is, you know, hopefully things like this, people can get a little more awareness. And someone else posted about the uh, NPS website. So there's, you know, for, for, for more information on registries. So there's, a, yep. I, I think the biggest takeaway is there's a lot of information. Um, maybe your house may be tried hard to find something, but there's a lot of information about all of the, the communities around us here in Connecticut. How do Google you Books, Google how do you books? access, sorry, Jake. Uh, yeah, so if you if you do a Google search, uh, let's see if I can go back to my slide. If I go to my Google search, so, and I move my chat, um, if you, there's a tab where it says more, and one of the options is books. Um, and that's where you'll find amazing information. That's where I found that Wallingford was teeming with turkeys and pheasants and, 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 and uh, wolves uh, back in the day. And somebody who was you know, much closer to the time than, than we are. So that's a great resource. It's, it's not always one of the options up front. Uh, in fact, another presentation I did, most people hadn't heard of it, but it's great. You know, sometimes you'll find something as random as, um, you know, 1919 automobile registry. 
for Jane M. Like, oh, bingo, there's my, there's my hint that I can find <laughs> information about that name. And a lot of crazy stuff is on that books thing that, you know, thankfully somebody took the time to, to, to register. Good questions. Yeah, I see there are more links going into the chat. So what we typically do after one of these presentations is um, we'll collect all of the links and resources that were talked about and send out an email to everyone that has the you know recording of the session, but also gives you the links that um, we were putting up in the chat. So you have those readily available. That's great. Well, thank you so much for everybody for joining and uh, Preservation Connecticut, Jane and Stacy and everyone there for, for having me. Wait, so it looks like oh. Will Neal has his hand raised. He has oh, for a little while. Oh, thank you, Jordan. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Bill. It's okay. Um, I'm, I'm about a mile away from you in Westbrook on Old Clinton Road. Oh. <laughs> hey, Bill. Or, or, or Mel Wright House and, the, and his uh, grave is across the street from you. But, so I had a question about about 25 years ago when we were looking for an old house. Um, every single one that existed before 1865, the realtor said was on the Underground Railroad, and so I became very skeptical because they couldn't have all been. It couldn't be true about all of them. I just and my guess would be that it's not very documented because it was illegal. So I wonder if you have any insight into that. Yeah, so um, I'll defer to the Preservation Connecticut folks in a second, but I, you know what, I, I probably a little bit in the same camp as you because people will say, oh, if your chimney is painted white, then you're a sign of the, the uh, Underground Railroad or that you were a Tory or a Patriot. And I, I think some of that's a little bit of legend. Um, I, I, I would look for some further documentation because I, I hear that a lot. You know, just as, you know, in later years, you hear things like, oh, they used to run gin during Prohibition. Okay, well, you know, maybe that's a lot of legend. I mean, certainly there were places that were, um, and, and some places are well documented. Norwich actually had a program where they would take folks who were freed and send them to Norwich Academy. God bless them. But I, I, I don't, you know, if every house is on the Underground Railroad, I don't know, maybe that was a particularly active town and very helpful but you know but you're right because it was underground there may not be some good documentation but there's probably you know to that point there's probably good stuff out there maybe Jane has some thoughts on that as well um just concurring with what you said that uh, there's probably more myth than um fact but um checking with the freedom trail that is also another resource for information and there is um a contact at the State Historic Preservation Office for Freedom Trail um, resources. Just yep. and another yeah. link that Stacy forwarded. So there's probably, you know what? There, I would say there's probably some good information that you know there's good information there, and there's probably some truth. Somebody somewhere was a host on the Underground Railroad around here, but maybe not everybody, right? Um, so, but 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 good, great question. And it looks like Stacy, when we get the resources, that will be one of the links. Yes. Wait, there was one more that just came in. Looking for the Oval Sealy Road Wilton info documented in the Museum of Connecticut History as documented underground railway. Well, I'll let you maybe speak to that one. I can speak a little bit to Little Liberia that there is a um, woman, Miss um, Tisdale, I'm going to, her mm -hmm. first name is going to escape me. Maisa. Maisa. She is devoted her life to reviving those free Freeman house mm -hmm. um, down on over by you. If you're, if you're coming up 95, you'll see that the smokestack, the, the candy stick smokestack, and there's two houses and they are broken down. She's, tirelessly trying to raise money and awareness but you know it i would say if you ever hear of a talk or you find something online with maisa and other folks there was a professor once at who's a tonic speaking this was a refuge an oasis for freed um, folks who were formerly enslaved in bridgeport and there's you know first-hand accounts um, of people saying 
forget Baltimore, forget Martha's Vineyard, come to Bridgeport. The cool air off the water is like nothing you've ever seen. And there were businesses and, and so on. So Little Liberia is great. Um, I would get in touch with my ESA, um, you know, maybe folks at Preservation Connecticut have some thoughts, but uh, there it is, Freeman Center. Um, hopefully we will get those homes turned into some sort of museum because it is a treasure and that story needs to be told um, that most of us aren't even aware of. Yeah. Um, and I don't know- And they've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes getting that um, center off the ground. So there, you, we will see changes happening there pretty soon. They've done a lot of fundraising and a lot of um, building partnerships. It was listed with the National Trust as one of the 11 most threatened a few years ago. Um, those, those buildings will be coming online pretty soon. Oh, that's exciting. And you know, that, that whole power plant is coming offline and being taken apart as we speak and it's right on the water. So it's, it's hopefully that will just come alive. And Jane Iden, there was a question about the oval and the Sealy Road. I don't, I, I can't speak to that one. Yeah, I think that maybe goes back to our general discussion about resources for the Underground Railroad. Okay, good. Well, I, I think, you know, probably more than we realized, probably each of our towns had a role in Underground Railroad. Each of our towns had a role in the revolution. And fortunately, we lost people in the Civil War as well. Um, it's all good reminders and, and, and also appreciation for all these you know, how hard was it to live in the days of the pond weed house and, mm -hmm. you know, all the things that we think of. I mean, these people didn't have heat. They didn't have AC. They didn't, we know they didn't have television or computers or internet. So, um, but again, this was, this was fun. I hopefully people enjoyed it. Hopefully uh, maybe we can do it again sometime. Yes, we enjoyed it very much. Thank you so much, Ken. This has been just a delightful chat and thank you for sharing your passion for historic Houses and, and digging up the stories. Well, we'll have more coming coming up soon. Thanks so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, you too. And happy birthday, Ken. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Time to go celebrate. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.